Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Well, it all started back in the summer of 21 with a photographer named Bruce Gilden. Ever since I started this channel, I knew this day would come. The day I would have to imitate Bruce Gilden. And oh, how I've been dreading it. His photography style is very in your face, and as a consequence, very polarizing. But I think once you learn more about his background and what he's trying to convey through his work, you can grow to appreciate it. So in this video, we're going to delve into Bruce Gilden's photography style, and then we'll put it into practice on the streets of Toronto. Bruce Gilden was born and raised in Brooklyn, and this permeates his personality, the way he communicates, and his outlook on life. His photography style is very intense, very direct, very New York, but beneath his gruff exterior, there's a lot of thoughtfulness which goes into his work. Gilden had a very rough upbringing. His father was a tough, mafia-type figure who often resorted to violence, and his mother suffered from alcoholism, was institutionalized, and later committed suicide. Gilden had his own share of problems with substance abuse, but after his mother's death, he got clean and focused on his career. His original aspiration was to be an actor, but while studying acting, he took a few photography courses and immediately switched over. Photography became a sort of catharsis, a way for him to break free of the trauma and restrictions of his home life, and explore the hustle and bustle of the city. When he started photographing New York, he had difficulty getting pictures he liked, even after shooting hundreds of rolls of film. Then, he started experimenting with Flash, and it was lightning in a bottle. Flash, combined with wide-angle, close-up framing, became his signature style, a style which has stayed consistent to this day. When I started photography, I always I fell in love with the quote by Robert Kappa, if it's not good enough, you're not close enough. My work's so close that sometimes when people think I'm, I'm not photographing them when I'm photographing them, they look behind them. The viewer will always feel like he's a participant because I work so close. The viewer gets the feeling that he's in the middle of the action. I use flash a lot because flash helps me visualize my feelings of the city. The energy, the stress, the anxiety, you know, that you find here. Because it's such a unique approach, it still comes off as fresh in other genres like fashion shoots, portraits, or documenting recent global events. When it comes to subjects, Gildan is always looking for characters, people who stand out from the crowd. He's especially drawn to people whose struggles in life are visible on their being, whether it's in the way they dress, how they carry themselves, or just the look in their eyes. I always rooted for the underdog. I need people to photograph who, who have been bruised by life. And a lot of people have been bruised by life. You don't have to be embarrassed to be bruised by life. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. People in my pictures are symbols for what I see. And it's how I express what the world is. I don't think the world is an excellent place. Gilden is very selective with his own work and his high editorial standards, combined with an uncompromising vision, have made him an icon in the photography world. He became a member of Magnum in 1998, and over his career he's received several grants, awards, and fellowships, enabling him to complete projects around the world. Gildan's signature style is up close with Flash. 
For his street photography, he mainly shoots with a 28mm lens on a Leica rangefinder, to which he attaches an off-camera cabled flash. I'll be using my APS-C Nikon DSLR with a wide-angle 10-20mm lens. For my off-camera flash, I'll be using a Godox speedlight and a wireless flash trigger. You know, you can't photograph everybody, you can't photograph every situation, because otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. There's a bit of danger with this photography style. Most people think if they try this out, they'll get punched in the face. I was more worried about the other person. What if they slip and fall? You might scare someone into thinking you'll randomly slash their face, because that's a thing that happens in Toronto nowadays. A lot of this is contextual, and I think this fear is exaggerated, especially if you're prepared and you choose the situation you photograph carefully. If you do this on someone who's walking alone in a dark alley, or if you try to take 20 flashing photos of the same person like a paparazzi, then yeah, these fears may be realized. But Gildan does most of his street photography in broad daylight, in hectic, crowded environments that already have a lot of noise, a lot of light, a lot of stimulation. So taking a flash photograph doesn't seem like such a big deal. You'd probably see stranger things on the streets anyways. One of Gildan's most famous photographs was taken at a street festival, and I was able to look up the contact sheet for this very shot. These photographs were taken at the San Gennaro Feast, a very popular Italian-American festival, which even made an appearance in The Godfather Part 2. Bruce Gildan loves to photograph this year the event. He writes, The streets are narrow, and there are crowds of people packed in like sardines in a can. They can't move too fast, so it's an excellent situation in which to take photos. On frame 20A, when I saw the little boy on the man's shoulders, I saw a living collage of New York. I think it works perfectly because the whole frame is filled. Everything is positioned quite right. And what makes it a genuine New York photograph is the signature egg cream sign behind. Busy street celebrations packed with people might be a more forgiving place to practice this style while minimizing the chance of backlash. That being said, if you're going to go through the trouble of doing flash street photography, you have to be quick and precise. If you look at Gildan, he moves like a cat, pouncing in and out. But he doesn't linger. After taking one picture, he keeps moving with his eyes looking down on his camera, which minimizes the chance of a confrontation. Most people he photographs don't even react. He's mastered these movements to the point where they look reflexive and natural, almost like a boxer ducking and weaving. And just like boxers use pads to train timing and distance control, we'll be training our photography with some accessories of our own. I picked up this not creepy at all styrofoam head at Dollarama, which I'll be using to test out body positioning and framing with different camera and flash settings. Doing such for my plant of fashion.
Controlling where you stand may seem trivial, but it can make or break the picture. Where you position yourself will influence the position of your subject, because people naturally avoid walking into another person's path. I feel almost like I'm a director out there. I am the director, and sometimes if I see something and the person turns the other way, I say to myself, oh, shit, he doesn't, he doesn't take direction well. Because you're diving in and out to take the picture, you don't want to have to worry about focusing. Stick to a small aperture to get that deep depth of field. I'll be using f10 to f20. If you have autofocus on your camera, you should have it turned off or at least limited. Because that extra fraction of a second that it takes to focus can cause you to miss some shots. So it's better to switch to manual mode and zone focus. Or if you're not comfortable with that, you can just limit it by setting up back button focus or holding the AF lock button. Flash freezes the motion of the subject, enabling you to shoot slower shutter speeds while still having the subject in focus. You can see this with a lot of Bruce Gilden's shots, where the subject is lit up and in focus, while the background often has motion blur because he's dipping in and out to take the picture. I'll be varying my shutter speed from 1 30th of a second to 1 200th of a second. 1 200th is the default flash sync speed for most DSLRs. With the right flash unit, you can go above this speed. It's called high speed sync, but it will naturally be harder to create motion blur in the background. I chose 1 30th of a second as my lower limit because based on my tests, any lower than that and you start getting trailing highlights on the subject. ISO isn't really that important. I'll be keeping it low at 100 to 200. Now, let's talk about the most important piece of equipment, the flash. Gildan uses off-camera flash. Separating the flash from your camera gives you more flexibility and an angled light source creates more depth than an on-camera frontal flash. You need a flash unit, in my case a speed light, and a flash trigger, which will sit on the camera's hot shoe. I've switched my speed light to slave mode so that it will be set off by the flash trigger whenever I hit the shutter. The speed light itself has different firing modes. RPT is repeated flash, which we don't want. You never know who's photosensitive to strobing lights, so we just want a single flash for every shutter press. TTL is kind of like automatic flash. It will measure the amount of light coming through the lens and then we'll limit the flash output accordingly to avoid overexposure. We don't want that. We want the flash to be harsh and overpowering, just like in Bruce Gilden's images. So to do that, we need to set it to manual mode. And from there, we can change the flash strength on the fly using the wheel on the speed light. You can also adjust how narrow or wide the flash will fire by choosing the equivalent focal length to match the field of view of your lens. I'll keep mine wide at 24 millimeters. Now the strength of flash will vary depending on which unit you have. Each model or unit has a different guide number indicating how far the flash can reach. For example, my Godox speed light has a guide number of 60 meters at ISO 100 and 200 millimeter zoom. This means that if I have the flash spread set to 200 millimeters and my ISO at 100, I can stop down to f10 and expect to light up a subject 6 meters away. This is assuming I'm firing the flash at full output. Flash output is measured in fractions of the unit's full power. Because we're going to be shooting outdoors during the day and we're dealing with small apertures, I'm going to be shooting along the higher ranges from 1 half to 1 eighth. One thing you should remember about flash is that like all light, it follows the inverse square law. If you remember your high school physics, it just means that the relationship between brightness and distance is not linear. If something is twice as far from a light source as another, it won't be half as bright, it'll be a quarter as bright. If it's four times as far, it'll be one sixteenth as bright, and so on. You'll be surprised how quickly flash falls off with distance. For photographers, this means we can easily use flash to separate a nearby subject 
from background elements just a few meters away. I know these are a lot of parameters to keep track of, but when I'm actually out shooting, what I'll do is find a combination of aperture, shutter speed, ISO within the aforementioned ranges that will yield a slightly underexposed image without flash. This will essentially be the exposure for your background. And then I'll go ahead and take pictures using flash, changing settings accordingly if it gets darker due to the weather or the day progressing. That way I can focus on looking for subjects and backgrounds reminiscent of Bruce Gilden's work. This preparation may seem like overkill, but it helps get you comfortable using your equipment to pre-visualize what the end result will be. If you don't prepare, you'll be wasting a lot of time and possibly annoying a lot of people trying out different settings on the day of the event. And that's what happened to me the first time I tried to shoot like Bruce Gilden several months ago. Bruce Gilden is good at what he does because he shoots what he knows. He's familiar with New York and the underdog type characters he photographs. My original plan for this video was to shoot at Caravana. I spent a significant part of my childhood in Trinidad, so I was familiar with what carnival is like, the mood, the people, and you know when the music is blasting on the road, everybody's jumping up and dancing up on everybody. So somebody taking flash photographs won't be a big deal. So I went there the day of the event, but back then I hadn't done all this preparation, and I couldn't figure out how to get my camera flash to fire correctly. This flash, you know. Alright, let's see if it works. I think I was using TTL mode instead of manual mode, and because it was a bright summer day, the flash rarely fired, so I ended up just packing it away and taking pictures without flash. But it was still instructive because I was able to experiment with wide angle close up shots, and I was able to see some of what Bruce Gilden talks about playing out in real life. I wrote that if you can smell the street by looking at the photo, it's a street photograph. You know, this thing about invisibility, I mean, I think you people overdo it. Yeah, when you have a little camera, you, you become a sneak. You know, so it becomes a, a different, the rules change of the game, okay? You know, you can be invisible and be very close, because sometimes I work so close that people don't realize I'm taking their picture. I wanted to be visible, like Gilden, so I wore a hat and vest and I always had my camera in front of me. I learned that when you dress like a working photographer at a public event, people are more at ease with you taking pictures of them. You'd probably draw more attention to yourself dressing all in black and carrying a tiny camera like many stereotypical street photographers. So lessons were learned, but the flash was missing, so this project remained unfinished. Ever since then, I kept my eyes peeled for another event that I could photograph. The 2022 FIFA World Cup was coming up. While I don't consider myself a big football fan, when you're Argentinian, you're born into it like a religion. The chants are memorized like national anthems. The pregame rituals, or cabalas, are observed with Eucharist-like solemnity. The physical jumping up, the waving of flags, shirts, or just bare hands ripple with the rhythm of a single beating heart. Other countries just can't compare. Living abroad does little to diminish these feelings, and Toronto got a taste of it back in the summer of 21, when Argentina won the Copa America. People were celebrating for hours out on the streets of St. Clair West, a predominantly Latin American neighborhood. If the same thing happened this year, I wanted to capture the feeling of euphoria and solidarity on the street, and the disorienting, almost dreamlike state of achieving a long-awaited victory. The matches progressed, and Argentina won the semi-final against Croatia. On that day, I went to the same intersection of the Copa America celebrations to get a preview of what it would be like if we won the final. It was dark and cold, but people were showing up in force well into the night. I got to observe how the celebration started on the side street, but eventually spilled out onto the avenue, cutting both lanes of traffic.
will probably be similar but much more intense on the day of the final if Argentina won. And then the day of the final finally came. Va Montiel! Montiel! After witnessing possibly the most dramatic World Cup final ever, we headed to St. Clair West for the after party. There weren't that many people at first, so I just relaxed and enjoyed the celebrations. In time, just like the day of the semi-final, more and more people started arriving. Eventually it got busier and busier and there were finally enough people so I could start photographing up close with flash. And this is what it looked like.
I used to look at many books and magazines, especially books, and I'd see what picture, which photographers I admired, which, which photographs I really liked, and I would try to discern how they got that picture, which lens they used, where they stood, and I learned from that, okay? And then you use that, what you've seen, and you put it into experience by going on the street and taking those pictures. I think what makes a good photographer is to know what's done in the past, take that, build on it, and make it your own.